Well, hello, writers. Welcome to episode number 129 of How Do You Write? I'm Rachel Heron. I am home from the travels, home from Venice, and I'm so glad that you're here with me today. Today we're talking to Nancy Warren, who is absolutely delightful. Uh, we bond over the genre of writing we do and have done, and I know you're going to enjoy the interview with her on how she writes. Before we jump into that, a little update. Um, I do apologize for being away. It was one of those times where I gave no excuses. I just disappeared. I was uh, too busy while in Venice to do the podcast. So that's the way the cookie crumbles sometimes. And I like, I always say this, but I like knowing that you guys love and forgive me anyway when the show doesn't show up in your feed for a couple of weeks. Um, But I would love to tell you a little bit about Venice. It was rad. It was rad as it always is, but this time was even better. And I don't know what to ascribe that to, except that I honestly believe that, you know, I'm a good writer. I know what I'm doing. I work hard. I'm good at discipline. But I think that my superpower is bringing people together and creating a safe space for them to do their writing in. I'm very, very, very proud of all the work that the people did in Venice. We had um, five days together in the classroom. We would write every morning and do the work together. And oh my God, I just saw things not only begin to grow, but burst into bloom in front of my eyes. I know that sounds trite and woo woo, but it's true. It happened. Um, also the people that came, I, another one of my superpowers is just attracting the most amazing people who all came together into a community of strength and there's no clicks. There's no exclusion. (laughs) The only thing, the only exclusionary thing that happens in Venice is that I usually freak out, um, by, 8 or 9 p.m. every night and I'm in my hotel room by 10 p.m. alone because I've been talking since 8 a.m. They don't do that. They all go together down to the bar on the corner. They go to Gino's, the place where um, they are known and they drink and have gelato until 2 in the morning and then they still show up at the desk in the morning. Um, So I thought that was phenomenal and it's such a bonded group of people and I miss them a lot already. Um, Other things I learned or took away from being in Venice is that I did the right thing in having my pre-retreat by myself. I very much like having the pre-retreat before the retreat instead of after, which I've done in the past as well. Having it before lets me relax into Venice and get accustomed to the time change and find my footing on the cobblestones. And something that happened this year that was different was that I was fighting a migraine for a good number of days while I was there. It got me once, um, but the rest of the time I was fighting it. And in a, in a move that felt like true wealth and abundance, honestly, I stayed in the apartment one day. I was in Venice and I chose to stay in the apartment and lie in the bed and I read two books and I looked out at the Grand Canal and watched the traffic um, of the boats moving around And I felt like the richest woman in the entire world, which I am definitely not. I bring home a few thousand from this retreat and it pays for me to stay in this 200 euro a night. Um, Very, 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 very small like studio above the Grand Canal. And I felt like a millionaire looking out and choosing to stay inside. It was wonderful. It was really, really wonderful. Um, I got a bunch of writing done, but even more than that, I got a bunch of reading done, which is what I really needed to do. Another thing I took away from Venice, don't eat too much gelato, man. One gelato a day is enough. Two is pushing it, three or four, too many. I think that's where my um, migraine eventually came from. Uh, And another thing I always fail to learn, and I failed to learn it again this time, is to provide time when I get home to decompress and get used to the time change again. I didn't do that. I landed Sunday night, Monday and Tuesday. 
I had a deadline, so I was working really, really hard for Monday and Tuesday, um, which left Wednesday. Yesterday, I was completely wrecked. I got up at 8, and I was back in bed by 10 in the morning. Basically, I couldn't do anything. Um, although, and then I got up shortly thereafter that and did a lot of stuff. Things are starting to roll with the release of Stolen Things. I... Um, met with my entire publicity and marketing team yesterday online, which was super exciting. So that is fun to think about. And um, in my own writing, I've given myself a two-week deadline to power through the synopsis and the first three chapters of two books that um, my agent is going to submit to my editor. So that's my next two weeks. But the rest of this week, today and tomorrow, I'm just going to be <laughs> plowing through the approximately 1 million emails that I am behind in. And they're all emails that require action of some sort. Uh, so I'm doing things like that and laundry and getting back into life. Um, I have to say there's nothing I feel more grateful about than being able to teach in Venice. And it is also okay. Really, it's really okay in my head that after Venice, I can't wait to be home and I can't wait to be back at my prosaic desk. This uh, cluttered desktop in my cluttered office. It's where I want to be. It's where I love to be. It's where I do my writing. And I'm just so glad to be back in it. So with that, why don't we jump into Nancy's interview? I know you're going to enjoy it. I hope that you're getting your own writing done. Um, do join my Slack channel if you haven't already done that. That's been pretty fun lately. Uh, you can get to that by rachelherron.com slash Slack. And it says that um, it's whatever Slack link is there, it says it's unsafe because it doesn't have the HTTP. P.S. for some reason, um, but it is safe. I went ahead and double checked that it does go right to Slack. So if you'd like to join, use that link and come talk about your writing and tell us what you're doing and what you're working on and get your writing done, folks. Enjoy the interview. Well, I could not be more pleased today to welcome to the show my friend Nancy Warren. Hello, Nancy. Hey, Rachel. It's nice to be here. I'm so glad to have you. Let me give you a little introduction before we get going. Nancy Warren is the USA Today bestselling author of more than 70 novels in romance and cozy mystery. Her current series is called The Vampire Knitting Club. Yay, knitting! Uh, she splits up her time between Bath in the UK and Victoria, British Columbia. That sounds so glamorous and romantic. Is it as glamorous as it sounds? Not when I'm halfway across the ocean in another plane. It's not romantic at all. But, <laughs> oh, it's, they're my two favorite cities in the world. And when you can't decide, you just have to split things up a bit. Uh, what city are you in, Victoria? You're in Vancouver, right? I'm in Victoria. Oh, right you are now. in Victoria. Yeah. Of course, that's uh, yeah. yeah. Um, I've never been to Bath. What is it like? Oh, it's amazing. It's like all the Jane Austen movies you've oh. ever seen. Honestly, I... And half the time, of course, there is a Jane Austen festival going on. So you walk down the street and there's like, you know, Mr. Darcy and, and 12 Elizabeth Bennet, Bennets of varying sizes and shapes, you know, and they're that just so cute, all dressed wonderful. up. Yeah, it's really fun. That sounds ideal. I would really like to get there someday. That's on my on my bucket list. So 70 novels, though. How, this is a show about process. How have you done that? Where do you... Where do you get your writing time? How, what does your process look like? Because that's really phenomenal. So when I start, of course, I've been doing this a while now. I've yeah. been doing this 20, 20 years. Yeah. So that, you know, when you do the math, it's not quite that extraordinary. But It's still um, extraordinary. <laughs> well, it was when I started because I, you know, I had kids at home and uh, I started with Harlequin. And, mm -hmm. you know, with Harlequin, of course, back in those days, I think it was the closest you could get to a full-time job mm -hmm. and still be a writer. They, you know, once you got published and, and produced good books on time, they, we would schedule, my editor and I would schedule up books in advance. And so it was great. And I did about four books a year. Then I started writing for Kensington and I added in a couple more. And then of course, so then when self-publishing came along, which I now almost exclusively self-publish, um, you know, I already had the tools. And of course, in self-publishing, it's like that only on steroids because everybody's like manically, you've got to put out more books, more books, more books. And so I've just maybe, maybe sped up a little bit. I still do four to six books a year. That's amazing. That's really amazing. What does that look like on a day-to-day -day basis? What is your, what is your ideal writing day look like? Uh, so I, I'm 
terrible schedules. I can't do them. You know, I do those like little plotted out graphs and then I never follow them. I can't find them. That makes Mostly me feel better. what it looks like for me is I say, okay, I need to, I need to do a book in let's say two months. And, and uh, I learned this from Bella Andre. She's like, you put your holidays in first in your year's calendar. What a beautiful thing to do for yourself. So I do that now. And then I'll, it'll maybe come out that I need 3,000 words a day. And so I know when I get up in the morning that before I go to bed at night, I have to write my 3,000 words. And maybe I won't get to bed till 1 in the morning because I messed around all day. But, you know, often, and I mean, I love what I do, right? I can't wait to get to Lucy and my vampires knitting in Oxford. It's so much fun for me. And so um, it, when it's going well, it doesn't even feel like work. It's really fun. I had so one of those a, days wow. today. Do we love them? I loved it. I could. I felt like I could have written forever. And I'm. I'm kind of a curmudgeonly writer. Sometimes I am very happy to say how much I dislike first drafts. And lately, I have been trying to embrace them. And today was really fun. And you often feel like that. Then I love the first draft. I am all over the first draft. The bit I hate is the second draft. When I go back and that first draft that was so fun when you're writing it, you're like. Uh, no, that wasn't me who wrote that. Some crazy person with no English skills wrote that. <laughs> oh, God, I hate that part. <laughs> I love that. That's my favorite part. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, we need I, – I wish we could actually purchase hats that we could put on and say, okay, now it's my enjoyable revision part. Yeah, where do you usually write? Do you write at home? Do you go out to the coffee shop? Uh, I write all over the place, absolutely all over the place, because I travel so much. Yeah. You, I can't be all precious about what I have to have in my my certain desk and my certain pen. I write on planes. I write on trains. Um, I write, do writing coffee shops. I get together with other writers and write. Um, I write in hotel rooms. I just write. I always, I love my MacBook Air. It goes with me everywhere. Me too. And, and uh, yeah, I'm just wherever I am. And what program do you normally use? Are you a Scrivener gal or Word? Can't get on with Scrivener. I use Word, um, not because I love it, just because I'm used to it. And uh, I have recently been doing more dictating, so I do, and then I transfer that over into Word. So my first draft is, and oh my God, they're terrible first drafts. It's like half the time the words don't even make sense. But, you know, sometimes I'm walking my dog and I do a few paragraphs and stuff. So I find that's been really good using Dragon. I've been doing that too. Are you using Dragon anywhere on your phone? I am, which yeah. I, which is a tip I recently got from Kilby Blades. How Me smart is she? too. I took yeah. the tip and I started using it too, and I, it's been fantastic. I know. I already had it on my computer, and I, and I love it. But this is taking it to a whole new level. Yeah. yeah, I love it. Oh, that's so cool that you did too. That's awesome. We were at the same uh, listeners. We were at the same Indie Uncon just a month ago or so, or maybe less. I think so. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. So, what is your biggest challenge when it comes to writing? Uh, what I already maybe probably alluded to is I'm not very well organized. I'm not very good at schedules. You know, there's a lot of stuff in life that goes on. Um, and yeah, so I think it's making sure, like if I set that goal for myself is just making sure by the end of the day that I did get that done mm -hmm. and that I don't get distracted by bright and shiny things. I love bright and shiny things like, you know, Oh, this is another great idea. And I don't, I don't know if you're like this, but it's like, the closer I am to the desperate end of the book and the more pressured I feel, the more, oh, I come up with these brilliant ideas for the next book. I'm They're so good yeah. and I want to write them right now. Yeah. They're the best book that's ever been written. They're going to make so much money. Just anything but what I'm working on right now. Yeah. Anything but. Yes. What is your biggest joy when it comes to writing? Uh, biggest joy probably is that email that you get. From that lovely person who says, damn you, I never got any sleep all night. I sorry, I thought I'd just read a few pages and at four in the morning I finally finished the book and turned out the like that's when I love what I do. And I you know, I mean, we think what we do doesn't matter. And, you know, particularly for me, I mean you do a much more much more weighty novel than I do. Mine are just no, silly no, no, and Dances and their light, you know, knitting coat, paranormal cozies. But every once in a while, you'll get an email and it, or you know, some kind of message, and it's someone who's like, you know, I was in the hospital, my husband had a heart attack, you know, whatever it was, and you know, that book, you just gave me a break for a few hours, and I think that makes me so happy. Then I think, hey, you know, I don't cure cancer, but what I do matters. That was my goal when I started writing romance was to give a respite to somebody who is either waiting in a hospital or actually in the hospital themselves. And when I started getting those emails, I thought this is, this is everything we're doing the world 
a service, a good yeah. act by these things. So I love that you said that. And the first time I got that email, I was like, it happened. It really happened. I know. <laughs> I, what I do matters. And that's important yeah. that we celebrate that. Exactly. Yes. Yes. And honor that. Can you share a craft tip of any sort? I can't, I don't know. Yeah, I think it's sort of craft. So I, um, I have these, uh, two lovely friends, um, Shelly Adina and who you probably know course, and, yeah. um, Linda McGinnis and we were in Sienna. Oh, I got to drop in that we were in Sienna. <gasps> lovely. And we were talking plotting and we were in one of those restaurants with, they have those, you know, that sort of craft paper, uh, placemats. Yeah. And, and we were so excited and we're just, and we move all this, you know, all this masses of food and pasta and stuff away. And we start scribbling on these placemats and we started calling ourselves the placemat plotters. And to this day, I don't know if you can see it behind me, but this is a placemat for, it's called popcorn and poltergeist and it's an upcoming book. And I don't know what it is about that paper, but it's the right size. It's got no lines, no instructions. And and I sit with it, and usually with these two gals, we plot, we plot a lot of the time together, and it's just like you start here, and you draw lines all over the place, and sometimes you have to turn it over and use the back, and it's like changed my life. <laughs> that is definitely the first time I've ever heard this tip, and I love it, but I have it's specific wacky. questions about it, because I'm plotting out a book right now, so I think I want to try this. Where do you get that kind of placemat? Well, Lind I think Linda actually pinched a whole bunch from Italy. <laughs> But I went and bought um, at Staples. Um, it's pretty much exactly the same paper and very similar size, and it's a and it's those easels, and it's just like the easels made of cardboard. It was like forty bucks or something. Oh, I know exactly and, what and, you're talking about. You know, yeah. and, I, and then yeah. you know, and you tear off that paper, and it's about the right size. So that's actually what that is. That's not a proper placemat. Yeah, that is the best <laughs> and one hundred percent unique. That is so good. I do my bit. <laughs> do you save the placemat when you're done? Do you put it away for posterity or do you just toss it with your post-it notes? I'd stuff? shock them because I'm so disorganized. Honestly, I'd start plotting the wrong book again and go, you know, oh, wait a minute. I already wrote this book. <laughs> How does that work with 70 books? Because I have accidentally already plagiarized several ideas of my own. Um, you know, like I'll, I'll be writing a book and go, God dang it, I did this 10 books ago. How do you do that with 70 books? How do you... <laughs> Or do you just not worry I think, about it? I, I, you know what? You can't worry about it. And I, if you have your favorite reader, your favorite yeah. authors, you'll notice everybody does it. Like, you know, and it's like, yeah. you know, Anora Roberts and I'll go, oh, I love it when she does this. I remember it from, you know, what some other series. But like, that's okay, right? That's true. You and know. we read the writers we love because we love what they do. And we always want more of the same, but different. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you'll always probably, because it's a different book and different characters, even if you've sort of plagiarized yourself, you'll have put a different twist on it for this book. Yeah. So I, I don't even worry about it. Okay, that makes me feel better. I accidentally put in two infertile women who wanted babies in the same three-book series recently, so I'm still smarting a little bit from that. Oops, <laughs> oops. Oh, well. It's um, what was on your mind. Yeah, and the readers like it, so. Yeah. Okay, so what is the thing in writing? When you get together with other writers, what is the thing that you always go back to talking about? When you're sitting with Adina and your other friends, what, what do you guys end up talking about? Uh, in part from moaning about like sucky <laughs> markets and, you know, whatever bad things are going on. That's usually how we start out. And then, um, I don't know, I think, I think sometimes it's just celebrating maybe like another book that we've loved or, um, being, we get all excited, you know, if, if somebody comes up with like a great plot idea and then, and then you all pile in and start building on it, you know, that's really fun. Um, I don't know. I think it's just kind of the support of people. There are so few people in your life. I'm sure you find this too. There are so few people in my life that remotely understand what this is like, except other writers. So, you know, I, I don't even think it matters what we talk about. It's just like, we get it. There's all those things you don't have to talk about because we all have this shared history and experience and, and career, this mm -hmm. wacky career that we do. And so, you know, you, rather than with your normal people in your life, like we're starting here and then we get to talk up at this level rather than, well, you know, so self-publishing is this, mm -hmm. you know, and we sell on Amazon, you know, we don't have to start all there. So I think that is for me what's so fun and just just that camaraderie with other people that are, you know, they're and they're wonderful, creative. I can't, I can't be with people that work for the government anymore. I can't do it because I just, I don't understand that world and it's boring to me. I just, I like wacky creative people. They're my life. <laughs> That's 
it's because we are wacky creative people. Exactly. Right. I always I always do tell people to to writers, um, not people. I tell writers to develop that friend group and that community with people who are roughly in the same place that they are. I have two best friends, Julia Blackwell and Sophie Littlefield, and we all kind of formed a friendship right as Sophie had sold but not published, like her book hadn't come out. I think my book had just sold and not come out and Julie had a couple books published. So we were all at the very exact same place. And as we've stayed friends for the last 12 years, our careers have taken the same trajectories, although Julie is majorly (laughs) best-selling. Sophie and I still aren't, but we, but we have the same language. We have always the same things that we're talking about. You know, um, would you agree I would 100% agree, agree. And yeah, she, um, Shelly and Dina, Dina and I started out together and uh, she's also, for, she's from Vancouver Island, in fact, and, and we've stayed friends for, you know, like this whole 20 years and have both been through Harlequin. And I also have this wonderful little online group and was, I don't know if you ever remember Harlequin duets. I don't even think they were out for very long. They were romantic comedies. Um, and we had a little private Facebook group or whatever. Yeah. Who yeah. I think it is. And It's been going for 20 years. That line has been defunct for about 18, but we all started together. We're all stupid and funny and say crazy things and all the things that you can't say in the public loops. Do you know what I mean? And I like, I treasure those women, even though I don't see them. Maybe I see most of them maybe once every two years when, you know, when we go to our WA conferences, but it's like, they're this magic little group and some are wildly successful. Some have stopped writing, doesn't matter. Yeah, so those are those I will always that. be your people. And I think the more successful you get, the more you need those people because you know, I mean, you know, I mean I wish I was in this position where I was like so big, but I think you do get to a point where y- y- you are a little bit suspect sometimes of what does this person really want? You know, yeah. which is one of the downsides of success, I think. So, it's nice to have those people that you know you can always trust and you're all supporting each other. That's so important. I love that. That is gorgeous. What would you tell um, this wasn't on your list of questions, but uh, but it's one that I've, I used to use a lot and I really like. And with you, with all your experience, what would you tell baby Nancy, if you could tell her, like, when she was starting writing, young Nancy, um, if you could give her advice about the writing life, what would you tell her? To do something else. No, <laughs> that is, the government that is not true. No. <laughs> no. I think the pension might be true. little Nancy is... <laughs> In fact, I'd say it to just about anybody who was quite a bit younger than me is don't take it all so seriously. It's all going to work out and try (laughs) and have fun and laugh every day and take the risks. What's the worst that can happen? You can fall and hurt your face and you get up and carry on and things just kind of work out. I love that so much because so many of us, and I include myself in this, it's so serious about especially production and publishing and every box that needs to be ticked and everything that we're failing to do. And I'm always thinking about all the things that I'm failing to do this afternoon because I'm doing X, Y, and Z others, but just take it easy, relax. I, honestly. And it's where, you know, Bella, going back to Bella saying, you know, I'm Bella, who's like one of the most productive, successful people yeah. I know. It's like, put your holidays in first. And I'm like, yeah, of course, because it's way too easy to go. Oh, I'm too busy for this. I'm too busy to take that hike. I'm too busy to go for lunch with my friend. And at the end, what is your life? It's, you know, what, what are the things that matter? And where do we get our story ideas if we don't get out? So, yeah, absolutely. And I think it's very hard now. You know, I mean, it was hard when I started, of course, because you had all those gatekeepers. And, you know, yeah, we all celebrate now with self-publishing that there are no gatekeepers and anyone can throw anything up on Amazon. But there's a whole lot of things that you need to learn. And and I think the pressure on people who are just starting out is, yeah. you know, you're supposed to have a book out a week and you're supposed to be doing all this stuff. And, and people forget that, you know, it takes a while, right? You we, Building a career is also building your writing muscles. And nobody was born a brilliant writer. We all have to learn our craft. And so that's what I would say to anybody starting out, I think. Don't take it so seriously. Your first book isn't probably going to be that great. Take the time to learn your craft. Do all that hard work. And then, you know, build slowly and have fun with it and be joyous. And it's going to work out. 
I love that. I want you as a motivational speaker in my life. <laughs> and luckily now I have this Anytime. on recording. You are. I get your motivational emails and I love them. Oh, yeah. thanks. You're like that for me. Thanks, yeah. Nancy. Oh, that makes me feel good. So what is the best book you've read recently and why did you love it? So I was, as you know, I, I'm writing cozy mysteries now and I haven't been doing it that long. And I've, and there are a lot of mysteries that I just missed entire series that I just missed. You know, I'm busy. And so I recently read a book and it's the first in her series, but it's called still life by Louise Penny. And it's uh, set in a small town in Quebec in Canada. And um, inspector Gomash is, you know, speaks French and English and he's like 50 and, and he's so wise and wonderful. Like I want to cut out some of the, some of his quotes and hang them on my wall. They're so brilliant. <laughs> anyway, I think the book, the series is like 18 books in or something now. And, um, so still life was the one I just read and I, I've just downloaded the next three or four books in that series so I can read them all. Cause I, I'm excited to have a new series. And how wonderful too, that you know that you have, as much as you want of it to look forward to, right? I love that. <laughs> I know. I love that. And we know that, you know, from our own readers. They want that. They want to be able to sink into something. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Oh, my gosh. Honestly, and I, and I love them to pieces, but it's like, I just get the book up, you know, I've just got like, there's five books in my, in my vampire knitting series right now. And it's barely a day old and I'll get like, Oh, this was so great. I can't wait for the next one. I'm like, dude, <laughs> me neither. Dude, it's a day old. Please, please. <laughs> I, but I also want to address too, what you said about, you know, the stress that especially new writers feel can't or can feel about doing everything so quickly. I think I heard this on Joanna Penn's podcast. She was saying, and this really freed something for me um, as a writer. She Joanna realized that she would never be the fastest writer ever. So she was able to let it go. And when she said that, I realized the same thing for myself. Oh, I am never going to be the person who writes a book in a month. You know, a good book in a month. I could write a, I have written crappy books in a month and then taken a while to revise them. But because I can't, I can let that idea go. Absolutely. And, and you know, Joanna, she writes those. They're, they're, they're pretty in-depth. There's a lot heavy. of stuff that yeah. goes into those and very mm -hmm. plot heavy and very research heavy. And, um, and yeah, like you have to look at the kind of writer you are and the kind of book you're doing. I can write a book in a month and I don't very often do that because then the next month I have to put my feet up and not do anything. <laughs> but what I can't do, I have no sense of direction. I, I can't like, honestly, it's so embarrassing when I go to the physiotherapist and she's like, lift your left leg. And I'm like, <laughs> you know, I'm like a puppet. My legs are up and down. I can't remember which is left and which is right. And I, and I have no sense of direction. And, and when you read those books and it's like, oh, you know, the sun was setting over whatever the west where the sun sets and the, you know, shadow is slanting this and these elaborate, you know, descriptions of settings, which I love to read. I cannot write them. And I was, I was funny enough, I was once giving a talk and an editor was, was, was there with me, not my editor. And I said, you know, I can't do setting. It's not my thing. And rather than spending, which I could, I could spend a lot of time and really work on writing better settings. Or I can say, I do character really well. I do dialogue and I do humor. And I put all my effort into that and I do as little setting as I can. And honestly, this editor said, Nancy, that is the best advice for anyone. Don't spend a whole lot of time on your weaknesses. Put your put all your effort into your strengths and be like the best at character or the best at dialogue and just kind of do the stuff that you're not very good at because you have to have it right. But don't put a lot of effort that's, into it. That's huge. I'm exactly, I'm exactly that way about setting and character description. I'm just not a visual person. Everything for me is in words. Either. Yeah. Yes. I just, I can't picture it. So I can't picture it to put it on the page. So I don't do it. I do exactly what you do. I skate by, I put a sentence or two in done. Hope you understand what the inside of an ice locker looks like. I don't even know what yeah. an ice locker is, but yeah, you know, like <laughs> use your imagination people because I can't do it for you on this, <laughs> but, but you'll want to keep reading the dialogue. I love that you said that. And I love that the editor agreed with you. I know. It made me really happy because I was like, I sort of always thought I was kind of cheating. And then it was like, no, she gave me permission to keep doing what I, what felt right for me anyway. You just passed that permission on to me and to others. So thank you for that. I'll have my permission. <laughs> Will you tell us where you can be found and what your latest book is? Tell us a little bit about it. 
Yes. So um, I'm about three quarters of the way through it. And it's the sixth book in my vampire knitting series. And it's called Fair Island Fortunes. And they're set in in Oxford or around Oxford, where I, I used to live in Oxford. And I love it there. Um, and it's a um, there's something in, in Britain called the Village Fet, which we would just call a village fair. And it's, you know, where they have like the face painting and the various booths doing various things. And I have an archery booth set up and um, and uh, one of the characters in my book, there, a lot of them are witches. This witch decides to do a fortune telling booth and it goes, as all my books do, whatever you said, I mean, it all goes of course terribly wrong and every fortune keeps coming true. And unfortunately she was like pretty honest. And so some of them are really bad fortunes and they all come true. And so, um, that's, that's the book that's coming up I and love that. It's coming on in the middle of April. I think I haven't even put it up for priority yet because I've, I've been a bit, Bit distracted, but I think it's coming up in the middle of um, April. How do you get and, your, how do you get your editing done in there? Uh, so I've been editing as I go. So oh, it's, you're in, well, okay. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I've got and then I will send it to. That's actually probably what's going to slow me down because it takes her two weeks the editor and then it comes back to me and I have to do some work. So, um, but I th- still think we might be able to do it by mid. So you by are Monday. one of those rare birds who does revise as you go along. Yeah, not always. It depends on the book. But with this one, um, because I have been traveling a lot while I've been writing it and I get and I sometimes can't actually remember where I am. So I've been having to go back. And yeah, it's if I honestly going back to what we talked about with first drafts, if I just race through and I'm having oh so much fun, you know, dancing through the tulips and then I get to the end and I have 60,000 words of absolute crap to go through. It's like honestly, it's just not, not a happy place for me to be in. And I, and I won't do it. So I really actually have to go, okay, I've done 10,000. I have to go back and at least get it to second draft and then maybe move on. So I found that has actually been something that's changed my process using dictation is I just can't go all the way to the end from the beginning. Like I used to. Well, especially with dictation, because you know, you'll have sentences that don't make any sense at all. They just came out wrong. And if you didn't do it, you know, the day before that your chances of remembering what you actually said are not that good. <laughs> where, where does it get that stuff? It'll be, I'll, I'll be like, know. the rabbit jumped on the bench. And I'm like, this is clearly a murder scene. There is no <laughs> rabbit. What? There's no bench. I know. It's <laughs> really, bench. it's really funny. One of my uh, uh, friends just did a, um, what did she call it? A uh, dictation fail um, giveaway on her, on her Facebook, which I thought was hilarious. She put what it said and said, can anybody tell me what I meant? And then she gave away $5 or something. That's funny. <laughs> I know. I thought it was great. Okay. Where can people find you online? Uh, so my, my website is nancywarren.net and I'm on Facebook. I'm absolutely hopeless, but I don't know. Nancy Warren author, I think. And I'm on Twitter, Nancy Warren one. And I have an Instagram, but I can't even remember what that is. <laughs> we'll find Details it. are not my jam. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, out, I'm out there. <laughs> well, it has been delightful to talk to you. I loved hearing what you had to say. And I'm coming away with lots of food for thought myself and, and extra tips and renewed excitement about dictation on my phone. So That's good. And come yeah. visit me in Bath. And I would love we'll, to. We'll dress up like Jane Austen. I don't know about that part, but <laughs> I'll come visit you. <laughs> Okay. All right, my dear. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.